Hi everybody, my name's Shane Johnson, for those who don't know me, I'm a co-host of Aussie Tech Eds, Australian podcast all about technology, broadband, mobile phones, computers, tablets, anything technology, Aussie Tech Eds will cover it. I'm here to, today with Tom Merritt, famous for shows like TNT, Twit, uh, Sword and Laser. What's the show that you do, Tom, that is the future based show, or you used to do? Uh, I used to do a show called Forecast. Yeah, we don't do that one anymore. But we, yeah, we get we just tried to predict the future. Okay. So, like I said, Tom's joined us. You've you've already heard his voice. So thanks for your time, Tom, and um and welcome to Aussie Tech Heads. Oh, I'm I'm honored to be uh, a little lead off hitter in your uh, in your interview series here. That's cool. According to your wiki uh, Wikipedia page, which I'm hoping is accurate, because all my research will go out the window if it's not. <laughs> you were um, born in Greenville, Illinois. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. That 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 Wikipedia page among Wikipedia pages has actually got a high percentage of accuracy. The the the, the folks that uh, that keep keep on it are are fairly attentive. So most of that stuff I think is correct. That says that your father was a food scientist, and um, and you've gone into technology and and journalism in particular. Is how did the where's the connection if there is one? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there is one. I mean, my dad worked for Pet Milk. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with that, but you know, they were available all around the world, condensed milk, evaporated milk. Uh, and I think the brand probably still exists in a few markets here and there, especially in South America. Uh, but at one point in the 1980s, he was the world's leading expert on evaporated milk. And so he would go to Brazil and Italy and Germany and uh, all over the place, uh, visiting plants, helping them set up their evaporated milk plants. Uh, and he worked on other foods. We'd, we'd always have like weird snack foods around the house that he'd be testing. So we, I later realized when I grew up that I was essentially a test subject for him. But we had like apple soda and ice cream and tacos because old El Paso was owned by, by pet. So the, it, that was fun. That was interesting. There's probably an underlying love of science in common between me and my dad, uh, for sure. And when I was growing up, I... You got a computer, and my dad was instrumental in encouraging me to to work on it and play with it. Uh, I've told a story over and over again about how I wanted to get an Atari 2600, and I saved up the money. And when we got to the store, he said, well, you can either buy the Atari 2600, or I will give you an extra $100, and you can buy the TI-99 4A. Uh, and so he kind of nudged me towards a more serious machine that way. So... Yeah, his love of science definitely influenced me, uh, and I've I've always been into entertainment and writing and all that sort of thing. So to be able to luck into a job that allows me to do the things I love with the stuff that I love is is pretty amazing. Okay, excellent. So that brings me on to my kind of next point, and you and you touched on it just in that last part of your answer. So you're you've done journalism, obviously you've been to university and got a journalism degree i believe you went to the university of houston is that correct no university of illinois uh for undergrad i went to the university of texas in austin for graduate school uh, okay i knew there was a texas connection in there somewhere so you've obviously done journalism you've done work in front of the camera you've done work behind the camera you've done this analysis kind of reporting you've also done on the on the field reporting like you've done ces coverage that sort of thing you're also an author, I believe. You write um, books. Tell us yeah, self-published. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the um, the authoring. Yeah, that's more of a hobby than anything. Uh, I'm, you know, maybe someday I'll get good enough at it to actually send stuff to agents or anything. But I, I've I've written a couple of novels. One one I started writing in like 1993. It took me forever to get through. Uh, and I take part in National Novel Writing Month every year in November, and knock out 50,000 words that then I've got sitting on my hard drive and, and can try to whip together. I've actually put out one other novel, United Moon Colonies, that came from that. And then this last year, I actually uh, played around with doing something serious uh, called The Chronology of Tech History, where I just took my interest in finding out what happened when in tech history on certain dates. And I put that up as a blog entry every day. So I, I took that and put it in chronological order and put it out as a book. And I have plans to actually take that and do uh, a much better 
higher quality version. Right now you can get a, a paperback self-published version if you're just interested in having the book, and that's great. But I want to do like an illustrated version uh, and, and, and something that's hardback and, and a little more of a, of a good shelf item uh, than just a paperback, trade paperback book. Yeah, just interesting you kind of into the tech history because one of the segments that I do on the Aussie Tech Heads podcast is actually this week in, in tech history. And um, I have actually pinched a couple of things from, from your blog as, as well as wide. So, um, yeah, thanks for doing that for me. Yeah, no worries, man. Uh, that's kind of the idea. I mean, I put the thing out Creative Commons, too. So if you, if you go to archive.org and search chronology of tech history, you can get the whole text. Uh, and, and please feel free to crib from that. Uh, it's, they're historical facts. Like, nobody has a copyright on them. And, and I think the more people that find out and know about this stuff, the better. Excellent. Okay, cool. All right, so... One of the questions that I wanted to ask you before we kind of delved, you know, before we went down the path of, of your authoring was, as I mentioned, now you've done front of the camera, behind the camera, the authoring, the editing, producing. What do you actually put on uh, government paperwork as your occupation? You know, that's a good question. I think I, 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 I had to uh, do this for something recently, and I feel like it changes every time uh, I do it. I, I used to put uh, web producer back when, when I was the website producer at techtv.com and that that seemed the most accurate and then for a long time I would put editor uh, when I was working at CNET even though I was doing a lot of video and audio I, my official t a title there was executive editor so uh, I have put that I have put writer although I feel a little like a fraud like I'm trying to pretend like I'm a, some famous author or something and I've put um, host for you know that's actually my title at twit because I host Tech News Today and Frame Rate there. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. Podcaster is probably the most accurate thing because that's most of what I do. Do you, any, do you get anyone kind of questioning when you put something vague? Like, I mean, yeah, obviously it means something to, to me and people in the tech industry, but to an immigration officer and they look at that, they go, what's that? You know, it, it, with immigration officers especially, right, they, it's kind of hard to tell what they're thinking. They're always kind of raising their eyebrow pretty much everything you say. I, I, I came back from England one time, and they asked me if I had bought anything, and I said some, some overly priced shoes. And they went, overly priced shoes, as if that was the most suspicious thing in the world. Uh, but, yeah, no, it's never caused an issue or anything. Again, more about your, your, your history and your background. You've worked for companies like CNET. You've worked for Twit. Uh, I believe you do some freelance uh, work as well. So can you tell me the, the pros and cons, I guess, for working for your big organisations like CNET as well as your smaller organisations like, well, Twit's probably not that small anymore, but it, it started out small. Yeah, Twit's getting bigger all the time. Uh, but yeah, it's still not the same as working for like Ziff Davis uh, back in the 90s, uh, which is when I got my first big technology journalism job, or or CNET, uh, which is now part of CBS, uh, the, the broadcast network. So it's, it's huge. And the nice thing about those companies are the resources you have at your disposal. So that's, that's not just money, but also manpower. You know, there, there's all kinds of people you can rely on for expertise and for questions. There's name recognition and that definitely opens doors. Uh, you know, if you don't have to explain what CNET is inside the technology journalism world, every, everyone knows what it is. Uh, and so with Twit, sometimes, sometimes you'd be surprised. Some people are like, oh, yeah, I'm a big fan, right, if they know about it. But a lot of people don't. Uh, and so they're like, what, tw Twit, what is that? That's an insult. And, and you have to, oh, it's This Week in Technology. And uh, so, you know, there's, there's, there's some definite pros to the big world. But I kind of prefer the smaller organization because of the flexibility it affords. When you, when you get too big, you start to find it harder to innovate, harder to push your ideas through. Uh, when you're in a smaller community or a smaller organization, uh, you have a lot more that you can just do. And, and that's the downside, too, is that you have to do it. There's not a team to do it, but you can just do it. You don't have to go to a meeting and get sign-off and get approval and allocate the resources and wait for five other people to do their part and misunderstand it and then explain it and all of that. Uh, it's just you and maybe one or two other people, and you just make it happen, which is the startup culture in technology. That's why all these small startups seem more nimble, and it's what all of these kind of middle-aged startups like Google and Facebook are starting to deal with is how do we preserve that nimbleness we had when we were small now that we're these huge behemoths? Okay. So just on that 
the the flexibility and and the the immediacy i guess of the internet keeping with the journalism theme do you think that journalism has either improved or declined since internet to internet technology and the 24-hour news cycle and and that sort of yeah. thing I think journalism has maintained, you know, a relatively stable level of credibility throughout its entire life. Uh, going back to the guys who would walk around shouting out the news on street corners uh, through yellow journalism and tabloids uh, on into television news and, and now the internet. Uh, everybody likes to think that their particular era is special in either how bad it is or how good it is, and I don't think it's either. Uh, you know, you, you, you have change, and when you have change, certain things suffer temporarily. So does the quality of your daily newspaper go down recently? Possibly. Depends on where you live, but, but quite possibly it has. That's because it's an old model that hasn't yet adapted. But has the quality of tech journalism gone up? I, I think immensely since the 1980s because of the flexibility that the Internet provides. And so when I hear people talking about, well, journalism has to be saved, journalism can't survive in a world of free news on the Internet, I look at things like tech journalism and I look at things like blogs and lots of niche topics and I see that there's very high quality stuff being done and making money, make, not making scads of money maybe, but it's, it's you know, able to stay afloat. And I, and I think that just shows that the old models that were doing the old kinds of journalism are going to take longer to adapt. And I think they will adapt. Uh, and I don't think high quality journalism goes away. In fact, I think we might have access to higher quality journalism overall because instead of relying on your local television, radio, and news source to kind of bring you everything, you can rely on a global source that has the best people in the best places. Uh, it's going to fluctuate in quality, and you're always going to have crappy stuff. You're always going to have people doing the kind of news that's shallow, that appeals to the lowest common denominator, and we've always had that. I mean, that's what the tabloids were about in the late 1800s, so I don't think that's new. It just goes in waves, and sometimes you'll have a period where higher quality seems to be winning out, and then it'll go back the other way, but Overall, I, I really do feel it remains constant. Like you said, there's different size organisations, there's different funding resources behind some, uh, and they have their own niche market. So that brings me on to th the next thing that I wanted to ask you about. You've got the big organisations, you've got your CBSs, you've got your Wall Street Journals, your Rupert Murdoch organisations, and then you've got the smaller ones like Twit, um, TechCrunch, the independent bloggers. Do you see a time where the big guy is going to gobble up the little guy? Yeah, and I think we're, you already see that happening. Uh, I think the little guy has a better chance to stick around independently and find things uh, that will be valuable more so than in the past because of the accessibility of the publishing platform, uh, and that being the Internet, of course, uh, in the past you know, we've we've said the same things about printing brochures, right? In the in the in the 1600s and 1700s, it was the pamphleteers were going to to drive out everything, and of course, it consolidated into large organizations. Uh, some of those large organizations are going to die, as they always do, and some are going to adapt, and some are going to acquire other smaller entities that will kind of take them over from within. Uh, and we'll get a whole new setup. I, I think retail kind of paved the way here. If you look at the th places that you can buy things online, it's a mixture. You've got your Amazons and your Ebays that are brand new products of the Internet, uh, but you also have lots of other established retail that has been around in brick and mortar forever that have finally kind of figured out how to catch up and sell things over the Internet as well. Uh, and so... I think you see that you're going to see that with media. You're going to see some of the big guys go out of business. You'll see some of the big guys gobble up a lot of the small guys. Uh, you'll see things like AOL, which here in the United States was an internet service provider for years, still is to a certain extent, but it's also much more a media conglomerate. And it's bought and gadget and TechCrunch and the Huffington Post, and it's creating a whole brand new association of, of these brands and a brand new big guy possibly uh, at least in, in certain areas of journalism so I, I think 
I, I, I want to, you know, I want to go back and, and emphasize that I, I think that you will see more successful small operations than you have in the past because of the fact that I can do this in my basement of my house, right? I mean, I could set up some lights and a camera and an internet connection and, and broadcast. That, that wasn't possible before. It, it was much more costly. Uh, and now, it's, since it's not costlier, more people can do it. But there's still something to be said of large organizations having the resources to push their message out farther to find higher quality people and put them in a room together and make higher quality things and i think that will continue to happen okay i just want to backpedal a, a little bit and talk more about the the journalism itself there seems to be especially in the tech industry there seems to be two kind of camps you've got your frontline reporters that are out there reporting the news kind of as it happens and then you've got the more of your analytical news reporter journalists uh, I guess at the moment you're probably more the latter with with the work that you do with twit you kind of analyze someone else's reporting and someone else's coverage you've also Definitely. done the other style of journalism as well you've been on the front line with covering CES and, and that sort of thing do you have a preference do you like one over the other yeah, obviously, I like the sitting back and analyzing because <laughs> that's what I do now, uh, day in and day out. And I think there's advantage to that. I think it get, can get a bad name if somebody who's doing the analysis wants to tout themselves as if they are breaking the news. And we try never to do that on Tech News Today. We always credit our sources. Uh, we always point to those sources. And we're very careful to get multiple sources on things not not just primary sources but secondary sources too we kind of know which organizations are good at this and which aren't so when we see something on a cnet an ars technica uh and a gadget then we know okay we've got three pretty reputable sources when we see it on some other sources even if it's in multiple places that we know are like those guys report things that end up being untrue we we tend to ignore it less so i feel like our value on tech news today is to provide insight because we're doing this every day and not everybody can to say like okay based on all of the things we see every day this is how it fits together let's put it in some context for you in the context of of other tech news and in the context of how we live uh, and it's also to curate and say you know what I think these are probably the ten buzzworthy stories that we're, that we're gonna give you the headlines on and these are the stories that I think deserve the most discussion and that's what me and my co-hosts do uh, on the other end you couldn't do that without the frontline reporting, without the people out there actually conducting interviews, actually fact-checking, uh, getting sources that are reliable, and, and putting out quality stories. So, you know, believe me, if, if one of us has to go, it's me. Uh, the Ars Technicas, the CNETs of the world uh, should stick around because they do a great job. Uh, and that's what the backbone of journalism that makes it possible for a more entertaining show that is, is more about analysis to exist like Tech News Today. Probably to go further into that, and you, and you touched on the being accurate, um, being creditable, having the story right. How much harder is that when a lot of the stories break over social media like Facebook and Twitter and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, one rule to follow that we try to follow is always, if you're going to say something happened, always say where it happened, right? If it happened on Facebook, you say, people on Facebook are saying, because that, we're, we're getting literate enough at this to know, all right, wait a minute, people on Twitter are saying, and in fact, we've run into that a couple of times, uh, and I remember specifically when Steve Jobs stepped down, we saw it on Twitter first, and we were very careful to say, Someone on Twitter is saying this. Uh, it's the and then we're like, actually, it's the Reuters Twitter feed, but that could be hacked. So there's a level of like, we think it's probably true, but we're still looking for another source to confirm it. And that's when we either look for an Apple press release to go up, or we see that somebody like The Verge or Engadget has like, okay, we've got confirmation from Apple that yes, Steve Jobs is. That's when we start to put it. And I think in in that case, it was either Wall Street Journal or New York Times that finally came across with a story that we're like, okay, now we have a reputable source reporting this directly, uh, and, and so we'll do that. A lot of people say, well, why don't you go cover your own stories? You know, why, ca why couldn't I have just picked up the phone and called Apple? Uh, and the reason is you have to develop those kinds of relationships to get them to answer the phone and give you anything, and those relationships are limited, and there are plenty of great organizations out there already taking up those relationships. We don't have the resources to do that. Uh, so what we do is is what we can do with with the small team that we have. Okay, so just to.
touch on a point you mentioned earlier, how you said that there are still organisations and people that don't know TWIT. Is that some? Is that somehow influenced the the lack of networking and, and connections you do have in these companies because they don't know TWIT or they do know TWIT but they've got the wrong impression of TWIT? It's usually not because they don't know TWIT. All of all of the companies that we cover are pretty much aware of us. There there may be some PR agencies out there that aren't. Uh, in fact, there there definitely are. But but for the most part, you know, we've been around long enough. We've been doing this long enough that that people know about us. What is questionable is how important we are. Uh, it's, it's no, hands down, that the New York Times is important. The Wall Street Journal is important. They're going to call those guys back. Even at CNET, when I was working at CNET, we would sometimes not get stories or not get uh, review units because we were on the web. Right, so there was a little like, eh, well, it's CNET, but you know, and then below CNET, when you, you know, especially in the early days, and Gadget would complain like, oh, they give everything to CNET first before us, and Twit's way down on that totem pole. You know, we we even though we've been around since ninety, well, not ninety, it was uh, two thousand four, two thousand five when Leo started it. It's been a slow climb, a slow rise. Leo's name carries a lot of weight, uh, but at the same time, because we're all of our shows are essentially discussion and analysis. We're not out there developing those relationships all the time. So it's, it's a little bit of, of, of column A and column B. One of, one of the things is that you know, we're such a small organization that we're farther down on the priority list sometimes. Uh, and, and, and the other thing is, is that uh, we just don't have the resources to constantly be making those contacts. All of that said it's definitely possible to make them. And I think our product review show shows that. Shannon Morris, who produces that show, uh, has done an amazing job uh, building on what Nicole Lee started in making contacts with vendors to get review units. And now that we started knocking on doors and, and asking for things, we get more things. And there are definitely people who are like, oh, yeah, Leo Laporte's going to review this? Absolutely. We'll get it to you. Uh, because he's been doing this long enough that his name does open some doors in a lot of places. The one thing Leo is kind of known for is the fact that he'll call it, as he sees it, he doesn't sign NDAs. Um, and I guess that way he gives him more freedom, gives you and, and, and the other staff more freedom. Have you ever experienced someone sort of say, well, look, no, I'm not going to give you a review unit just in case, you know, you bag the thing? Uh, I have definitely heard the other end of that. No, I, I've never heard anyone say we're not giving you review units anymore uh, because we're afraid you're going to say negative things. And most of the stuff I ran into at CNET, we actually do sign NDAs at Twit now uh, for certain products. Leo tries to avoid those. I try to avoid those too, actually, because I just don't like trying to remember what I can and can't say. I want to be able to, when you're dealing, that's the one thing about dealing with analysis. You want to be able to have your opinion all the time. You don't want to have to hold it back. Uh, at CNET, definitely, there were a couple companies that stopped sending us review units for a while. And, you know, that was that. Was that. We still reviewed the stuff. We, you know, we just got it by buying it most of the time. Uh, and they were companies that were kind of punitive to a lot of people, so we weren't in, in the same boat. What is more common, I mean, we weren't in a different boat. What's more common is to have companies complain afterwards that you weren't fair or you weren't accurate. Uh, no one will ever say, we're going to cut you off from vendor units if you don't change your opinion. That, that, that's too crass. But what they will say is, no, 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 what you wrote is misleading, or it's wrong, or give us a chance to show you why what you wrote isn't accurate. And, and that's, a, that's a delicate line, because if you are wrong, you, you want to correct that as a journalist. You want to, you know, we all make mistakes, and you want to make sure. But there are times when it's like, no, I'm not wrong. You just wish I was wrong, or you're trying to spin it really hard. And that, that's where it gets tricky when you're dealing with the vendors directly. All right, so I want to move on to a slightly different topic. Uh, it did kind of follow on from when we were talking about Facebook and, and Twitter. And that's the topic of, of privacy. In in your opinion, is there ever been and will there ever be true online privacy? I uh, no, not true online privacy. I mean, I think it's safe to always operate under the assumption that Everything you put in digital form, fr frankly, everything you say out loud, too, uh, can be discovered. doesn't mean it will be, but it can be. Uh, so 
I, I think in that absolute sense that you put the question, the answer is no. But I think there's a lot that can be done to protect privacy. I'm not a Scott McNeely who says you don't have any privacy, get over it. I think I think a certain level of privacy is not only important, it's essential for the operation of the Internet. You just have to understand that there are gradations of it. And if you have good privacy somewhere, don't expect that it will always 100% protect you. you you, you got to be aware of that. And so be smart about it. Uh, I, and I think where, the, where this battle truly is being fought is a negotiation over how much of my information am I going to give to a company in exchange for what they have to offer. And what Facebook does, in my opinion, isn't so much invade privacy, it's seize information for purposes that you didn't originally give them the information for. And Google gets in a lot of hot water for the same thing. Uh, so so it's, it's more about, okay, I don't mind giving you certain information about myself if I know what you're going to use it for. Don't start using it for something after I gave it to you under a certain, uh, under a certain premise. And that's, that's all being worked out. A lot of the information that I found when I was doing research for this interview was, was all online. Uh, like I said, your Wikipedia page, basically most of it came from that. What I know of you on, on Twit and with your work with CNET, Sword and Laser, the work that you've done with Veronica, and, and you know, yada, yada, yada. Is, has there been, you being a, a public figure, and I mean, I guess you're probably more used to it, of how the internet works and how privacy works and what you need to do. But that said, is there, has there ever been something that you didn't want to get on the internet actually get on the internet? Sure. I mean, nothing dramatic. There's never, I've never had some big secret about myself that I was trying to hide that that got published uh, that has happened to other people and and some people get very upset about it and some people just kind of shrug their shoulders and go well you know what I I know how the internet works so I expected this might happen uh, and I feel like that second is probably the best way to deal with it um, I've been fairly comfortable with sharing a lot of things and that has helped me not get upset when things get shared because I you know I talk about my family. I talk about stuff uh, uh, that's going on in my life on my shows on Twitter, uh, and and honestly, most people really aren't interested in digging up weird, bad stuff about you. Some people are. There's enough of them out there that it definitely happens. But uh, I, I've been. I think I've been pretty lucky in that respect. Okay. So just following on about the the amount of information that's out there and using it for or or keeping it and using it for the wrong purposes or not the original intended purposes, do you think that government agencies, ISPs, uh, prospective employers, are they crossing a line by keeping information on you, doing research on you, uh, and, and that sort of thing? Or do you think that's kind of fair game? Uh, I, again, I, I think it all depends on disclosure. Uh, I think it's fine to collect information that's publicly available, scrape it off the internet, as long as I know they're doing it. Uh, I think it's fine for a company to hand over certain aggregated, anonymized data to a government research institute, as long as I know they're doing it. Uh, I, I want to be able to say, no, actually, I, I don't support that, and I don't want my information going into that data bank. Uh, or to be able to go say, oh, that seems like a worthy institution. And the data they're taking doesn't seem like it's it's all that dangerous for them to have. So, okay, I, I'll allow that. It's all about opting in. And, and frankly, that's the lesson that Facebook seems to be very slow at learning, which is don't just change things because you're an engineer and you know it's going to work well and you don't think it's very harmful and you change it. You've got to get people to sign off on stuff, and, and, and that's hard. Uh, when you're running a website, I mean, and I ran techtv.com for a, while, a few years, it makes things harder. It makes things slower. But it's worth it in the end because you avoid so many potential problems if you just ask people, will you hand over this information? It's surprising how many people will hand it over willingly. And in fact, there was one instance at Tech TV where we had a, a contest and the general manager uh, of TechTV.com, who was in charge of all the sales, wanted to include an opt-out newsletter subscription. In, in other words, you'd have to uncheck the box. 
And I'm like, that's, that's a bad idea. You don't want to force people to get stuff that they didn't expect they're going to get. And he's like, well, it's right there. It tells them they're going to get it. They can uncheck the box. I'm like, yeah, but people don't read closely. And this is going to show up in their inbox, and they're going to accuse us of spamming them. He's like, well, if we, uncheck, if we leave it unchecked, nobody will check it for the same reason, which is a fair point. So I actually found an Australian university research paper. I wish I could remember. It might have been Queensland uh, that talked about how when you actually forced opt-in, in other words, or, or forced an option, so you didn't check anything, you just made them answer the question. You said, you have to answer yes or no before we can move on, but neither option was checked. You got a higher adoption rate than if it was already checked and certain people were allowed to uncheck it. Because when you asked, people were more likely to say yes, but when you presumed the yes, more people were likely to uncheck it because they were mad that you assumed a yes. So that's the kind of lesson that I, I wish all of these institutions, government or otherwise, would learn is that you have to ask first and you're likely to get a better response than you thought. That's interesting that you sort of it's, – it's almost like people appreciate the fact that the company or organization is actually being courteous to them. Yeah, I think courtesy goes a long way. Granted, I'm not saying that that's going to make everybody say yes. There's still going to be plenty of people who say, no, I don't want you to have any of my information. Uh, and you're not going to change that. That's the thing. There's a certain middle ground in there where people are like, well, I would give it to you, but you're just trying to take it. And so now I'm, now I'm not going to give it to you. It's psychology. So just on the, on the Facebook issue around privacy and how they seem to be kind of struggling with it, you, you made a comment about how or you imply the engineers are sort of saying this is how it should work do you think there's in that particular aspect they they've got a lot in common with say apple i mean apple forced a lot of their design and their technology and, and their features onto us i mean as it turns out they were right but do you think there's a connection there yeah, I do. I mean, it's an engineering mindset. And I, I don't use that as a pejorative. Uh, but when you're creating something uh, and you're good at it, you know how it should work best. And if someone else is out there saying, yeah, but I don't want it to work that way, the impulse and the very valid impulse is to go, you're wrong. It should work this way. And that's exactly what Apple does, right? As an entire organization, they are that engineer who's self-confident saying, I actually know how this, how this works and you'll thank me later. Uh, a lot of engineers think that. That's fine up to a point, but there's certain things where even if the engineer is right, you have to let the user learn the hard way uh, what they actually want. Uh, and and privacy, privacy, I think, is, is an essential area where you really got, you have to give the user total control over their information. All right, so while we're on the subject of big organizations like Facebook and, and Apple and and other organizations like TV and, and media. I want to move on to things like geographic restrictions, pricing and, and piracy. Rightly or wrongly, um, Australia seems to get a mention in the top half a dozen countries that pirate things. Now I, I understand why people shouldn't do it, I understand to an extent why people do do it and, and based on my kind of anecdotal evidence, I don't think it's would Australians and people in general do it because we want to put people out of out of business or or you know have independent artists kind of not make money and, and that sort of thing it, it's in my mind it's more the fact that especially around media and music and, and software and and there's a big government uh, inquiry in going on around pricing in Australia at the moment the this, they have like a Senate committee. I guess it's the same as what they do in, in the states, where they actually even strongly encourage. That. I don't want to use the word sort of subpoenaed or anything because I don't think it, they can. But they basically invited the executives of of Adobe, Microsoft, and Apple to front the Senate committee and, and explain why a thing so more expensive, especially music, movies, software where it's all the same zeros and ones, no matter where you're getting it from. Uh, and, and there's an example that they covered with Adobe. Uh, one of the creative suites, I think it's the, the recent creat creative suite, the price that we pay in Australia, you can, someone from Sydney can jump on a plane, go to LA, buy it in America for whatever the price is, come back and still have $600 
in their pocket. Yeah, no, I remember seeing that story. It, 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 it's insane. Uh, it may, maybe the throughput is a little slower to do that. It's going to be harder on your knees if you're sitting in coach because that's the only way you can make that fair work. But it's ridiculous that that's even true. Yeah, that's true. I, and I guess what I want to sort of really ask about that that whole topic is and and backing up on the and the whole piracy thing i mean that's why people do it because in the in the case of tv shows i mean they're released in america i know with big bang theory even though we advertise it over here as straight from america fast tracked we're still three or four weeks kind of behind and we want to avoid things like spoiler alerts and and coverage and everything on the internet and and see it firsthand uh, and then you've also got the the um the the money difference how do you in your opinion i mean if you were the guy that was sort of responsible for fixing this mess what sort of things would you would you institute would you have worldwide releases would you have international kind of uh international pricing how would how would you fix the problem yeah, if I if I was king of the entertainment industry, I'd totally do worldwide releases, I, and and I think we'll end up there. It's it's just a fact of the internet that time difference matters very little anymore, and we ha- we have some things like that in the United States of our own. We don't have as many because so much of the content is produced here that that we get a lot of it right away. But Doctor Who, for instance, uh, for a long time was aired sometimes up to six months after it aired. In the UK, and so if you're a Doctor Who fan, I mean, you get the Christmas special in July that just didn't make any sense. So there was a strong uh, motivation to go and and get get them elsewhere until BBC America got hold of the rights to air Doctor Who because it was on the Sci-Fi Network here before that. And at first, they were putting it out like a week later, and I was like, well, I guess that's fine. I mean, that's 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 better than than months and months. But this. Finally, they just gave up, and they're like, look, we're going to put it out simultaneous. Now, it won't be the hour that it's showing in the UK because because of the actual time difference, uh, but it'll be essentially the same day, and the Christmas episode actually showed on Christmas uh, in the United States. So, woohoo! We, you know, we finally have one organization wrapping their head around it. And there's other things like uh, the Oscars, uh, for instance, uh, is an exception to this, but most awards shows uh, in the United States, even though they happen in Los Angeles, are shown on tape delay in California because they they think, well, 5 o'clock will be too early for people to tune in to something. So we want to show it in prime time at 8 o'clock. Uh, so there's just a bunch of ridiculous listen, like stuff like that, which has got to go away because... We all know the dirty secret, even if it's wrong, is that you can access all of this stuff anyway, uh, some way or another, if you're persistent enough. Now, why not compete with that by offering a higher quality, easier to get version that you can charge for and make your money? And the problem is uh, a misunderstanding of what's going on in the world and how prevalent Internet access is and, and, and what it means to folks, uh, and also just an emotional action of like, I'm not going to bow into these young whippersnappers who want everything whenever they want it, which is just irrational. I mean, it's a marketplace. Give the people what they want, charge what they'll pay, and and that's what's going to happen. And we're we're just seeing a s- slow moving ship slowly turn. We we've, we've already seen how this is going to play out with things like music, which is now DRM free and and basically worldwide releases. For the most part, you you don't hear about these problems in music anymore, uh, and that's you know think about that. That's kind of amazing that the music industry can be considered more innovative uh, than any other industry, given some of their history. But they are they they've finally come around in in a lot of ways. And I guess uh, you'd have to probably thank the likes of of Apple and and Steve Jobs in particular for pioneering the the music industry, and I guess by extension. He's also they also do books and audio books and movies and TV shows. So um, yeah. So what you're saying, I guess, is when the current generation that are that are into the movies and doing things in a not so legal way, when they start to become management material and and important people within the industry and within the companies, that'll just kind of change through some sort of natural progression. 
Yeah, and it's already starting to change. I mean, there's sort of an irrational fear of the unknown. In fact, I was I was talking to somebody who was talking about how dailies are done in film. They, you know, it used to be you'd take the film canister out. Now they shoot digitally. Uh, and for a long time, that was that was a problem. They would actually burn the digital files to DVDs for people to review the dailies. Now there's a whole online system, and that was resisted for a long time because people were afraid of piracy. And, and the fact of the matter is, piracy was never a real concern for that system, as long as it was properly put into place with proper security uh, restrictions, etc. But there's that just kind of irrational fear of, like, piracy is everywhere. It's lurking in the corners. It may leap out at any time. And, in fact, piracy is almost unstoppable. What you want to do is compete with it and make it the less attractive choice, in my opinion. Okay, cool. Excellent. All right, so I want to move on to more kind of miscellaneous topics. And, I mean, these questions and the answers you provide could be kind of short answers or you can you know, go in, into great depth completely up to you. So the first one is, do you consider groups like Anonymous as more criminals for what they do or are they more kind of your vigilante, dark superhero kind of organisation? I think actually vigilante is a good word for them. Not superhero, but they're people who believe that what they're doing is absolutely right, and they're often on the other side of the, of, of the law. And the other thing about Anonymous is Anonymous isn't a group. That's the whole point. It's, it's an anarchist, not even collective. So a lot of people who operate under the banner of Anonymous are civil disobedience. You know, They're trying to correct injustices. Others are, are, are less justifiable in, in what they're doing. Uh, but I think yeah, vigilante is a good word because the vigilante always thinks that he or she is is serving the greater good by doing what they're doing, even if it is against the law. So they they're more like the protest group of the '60s kind of thing. Uh, they're like many of the yeah. In fact, I think they uh, their their ideology, if you can call them they and call it an ideology, but a, a lot of the thoughts that they express have their roots in a lot of the movements, uh, situationist movement of the 60s, uh, the, the yippies. Uh, there's, there's a lot of examples of similar thinking. All right, so these last couple of questions are going to be more, more about you and, and you know, what, you're, what you're doing, what, you kind of, what you're into sort of thing. So outside of technology, what other stuff are you into and what would you say percentage-wise that kind of takes up of, you know, of your time? Yeah, these days, doing the shows that I do and the things that I do takes up a large majority of my time. Uh, the things that I do when I'm not working on stuff is eat. I love to, I love to eat out. Uh, I love uh, there's the gastro pub movement has got kind of a hipsterish reputation, but man, there's some good food with really good craft beers out there. So I, you know, if I'm going to be branded a hipster for going to gastro pubs, that's fine with me because I enjoy eating it, even if I don't always enjoy all the people around me. Uh, so yeah, I like to eat. I like to travel. I like to to visit places, uh, and and uh, I go jogging with my dog, which is always fun. Okay, I thought there'd be exercise in there somewhere because I'm um, obviously I've seen some of the CES coverage you did where, you know, there's like, you know, you're standing and you're not stuck behind a desk and, you know, you're a tall kind of lean kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm lucky in my metabolism too. Yeah, exactly. I guess uh, if if technology wasn't the thing, I mean, are you, other than the jogging, I mean, did you ever consider things like basketball, volleyball, that sort of thing? I, pl I played some sports in high school. I played baseball, I played basketball, track. Uh, but yeah, it was, I was never very good at any of it, so uh, it was never a serious career thought for me. Basically, just on the career, what, what do you see happening with you personally? What have you got planned for the next 12 months, both personally and, and through Twit? Yeah, I'm doing a lot of stuff. Uh, we're, we're full speed ahead on Tech News today. Could not be happier with that show. I mean, right now, I never want to stop doing that show. Sarah and I, as and I, are just clicking. It's fun to do. People seem to like what we're doing. Uh, you know, knock on wood, I hope it stays that way forever because it's just a blast to get up and do that show every day. And I really enjoy what I'm doing with Frame Rate, uh, which is our cord cutting show because I've always said uh, we're just too early on this show because it's not one of the more popular shows that I do uh, with Brian Brushwood, but it's getting more and more popular as more and more people are getting their video over the internet or, or you got shows like House of Cards created specifically for Netflix, lots of shows created specifically for Hulu here in the U.S. Uh, you've got lots of shows being created for the internet all over the world. 
So I, I think we're, we're on the cusp of, of that topic finally becoming incredibly important. So I'm really excited about both of those. Uh, I'm also working on a bunch of independent projects. I have a, a really crazy project I do with Justin Robert Young called FSL Tonight. Uh, and we're going to try to do a Kickstarter for our third season. The, the idea behind the show is that we're sports announcers recapping fantasy sports, literally fantasy and science fiction sports. So the teams are drawn from science fiction and fantasy, like the Vulcan Velocity or the Mordor Crows. Uh, and that's, uh, that's just a lark, essentially. Uh, and we've got a third season of Autopilot coming up at the end of this year. Scott Johnson and I do 12-episode uh, seasons where we watch pilot episodes of television shows uh, and then comment about how they were made, weird things that were, that were there at the beginning, and how it changed uh, as it became a regular series. Or in some cases, the pilot was the only thing, and this is why it never got picked up uh, as a series. And I'm just about to launch, in a month or two, a comic book I've been writing with a guy named Len Peralta, uh, and more details to come on that, but I'm really excited about that. We're having a lot of fun putting that together. He's a great artist. So with the with the last few you mentioned, the show where you analyze the the pilots, and also with the comic, with the with the pilot show show that you do, do you get those pilots? ahead of schedule or do you just see the pilot when everyone else sees they're, it? They're, not, they're old pilots, you oh. know, so the idea is like we go back and we watch the, the pilot episode of Chips, right, and then we talk about how that story changed when it became the famous series Chips uh, or Life on Mars, the US version, uh, we talk about not only how it changed from the UK version but also there was a pilot shot with an entirely different cast uh, that we can look at and we can say, okay, why did they change it to Harvey Keitel uh, and the other cast members that they changed it to. So it's it's more old shows uh, than current shows. With these shows that you're doing, I mean, with Twit as an organization, they're obviously more into the tech theme of, of shows. With these shows you've just mentioned, they're obviously they're not necessarily in that vein. Do you see Twit expanding to cover more genres, or are they going to remain tech focused? No, I think they will and should remain tech focused. The few times we've ventured outside of technology at Twit, it hasn't gone well. Uh, the audience wants us to do tech, and they want us they want us to do more tech. Uh, the most successful shows we've launched recently have all been like right in the wheelhouse of technology. Things like All About Android, i Five for the iPhone, Know How, which is our help and how to show. Those are those are all hit shows now. Uh, and they're right in that wheelhouse of technology. So some of the stuff I did, like Forecast, that we mentioned at the beginning, it, it ventured too far out, outside of the mainstream of what our audience wants. Uh, and the audience is growing, and, and we know what they want. So we're going to keep giving them good stuff in the world of technology. I guess other examples of, of shows like that would be you know, Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, Ray Maxwell's House. Um, I used to love that show. That was a good show, that one. Um, but yeah, because they were kind of probably just that too far out of technology, that's why they kind of yeah, didn't last, which is unfortunate. Yeah, and, and they, you know, Dr. Kiki uh, is still doing her hangouts for Science Hour type content. She's still got This Week in Science. Uh, and so they'll probably flourish better outside of Twit. Uh, at least that's the idea is they have a better chance. All right, so one final structured question. You've, with TNT, uh, or with the, the whole twit thing you've moved to los angeles i believe that was primarily because uh your wife eileen got a job with youtube is that correct yep that's right so how was that work in that um i mean is it a purpose-built studio is it just a room in your house do you um has it changed the dynamics of the show like tnt the fact that you're still kind of the anchor but but you're not really there running the show yeah, it's uh well to answer the first question, it's uh, uh we rented a house in Los Angeles that had a large downstairs room, basement room, uh that's perfect for this. So I have a Canon G10 camera uh connected by HDMI to a Blackmagic Intensity Extreme box that goes into a Mac Mini, uh and then I've got Verizon FiOS fiber internet that I stream out on. Uh and then we got Brent By, who's the guy who hung the lights for the Twit Studio in Petaluma, uh to come and hang uh a a couple of lights around me to give me decent lighting because that's actually the hardest part to get right um and then i've got a high pr 40 microphone and that, that's it that's that's all i need that's hooked up to a blue icicle uh usb to xlr adapter um so 
yeah, purpose built studio might be a strong word for it. We were really concerned about not changing the dynamics. I mean, Twit has so many hosts that are not located in Petaluma. Paul Therott, Mary Jo Foley, Gina Trapani, Jeff Jarvis, the entire Ham Nation uh, cast. Uh, it's, it's actually the exception to be there. So we knew it could work because we do it all the time, but we wanted to make sure we preserved the, the nature of the show, and it's worked out a lot better than we expected. Uh, having the big fiber connection makes all the difference in the world with latency, so you don't get that problem you have sometimes with Skype where everybody's a little off by a few seconds. Uh, everything works really well. And, uh, you know, I just had a meeting with them because I was up in Petaluma a couple weeks ago, and the things we were talking about to improve the show mostly had nothing to do with me not being there. They were all about just ways to, to have better coverage and better conversations. We have gone to a little bit more of a directed questioning where, you know, we'll, we'll throw a question directly to a guest. But I guess we're almost always on Skype anyway, so it's probably a good thing to do uh, because you don't have that eye contact where you can just kind of see that somebody is ready to stay, say something. But other than that, I, I'm very pleased with how well the show is adapted. Oh, okay. So that backdrop behind you, is that a real fireplace or is that a green screen effect? Or? No, that's, yeah, everybody says it looks like a green screen, but oh, that's a, oh, that's that's a real, real fireplace back there. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or you're really good at editing one of the two. <laughs> that's really good CGI, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so the last segment that I want to do, just kind of word association, just for fun, just say whatever first oh, pops in your mind. Um, Before I get in trouble. Yeah, yeah, probably. Um, bit words, sentences. If you if you think it's an in-depth kind of thing, feel free to you know wrap it on for a you know, couple of minutes. Completely up to you. So the first one, Apple. Joy. Microsoft. Butter. Google. Home. Mark Zuckerberg. Guy. <laughs> I wonder how well Not you very would do. That. <laughs> I wonder how you do with the um, ink blot test. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Steve Jobs. Dead. True. Steve Wozniak. Alive. <laughs> <laughs> Rupert Murdoch. Sky News. Julian Assange. Wiki. Just on Julian, do you consider him and what he does journalism, or is it is it criminal, or is it? No, I don't consider what he does journalism, although I see the arguments for it. I understand what people say that when they, it's sourcing. Uh, and whistleblowing in general, I think, is incredibly important. Uh, there's a civil disobedience aspect to it that I think is justifiable, uh, but it's a case by case basis. Uh, and it's all muddied by the fact that he's got this other court case going on that has really nothing to do on the surface of it with. WikiLeaks and, and what he does. Uh, you know, we, we could have a, a, a long, in-depth discussion about what he has done that is justifiable and what isn't, and I think everybody's opinion would be a little different on it. But I, I, don't, think, I don't think he's made the right choice every time, uh, but I think WikiLeaks as a concept probably is incredibly important in a lot of areas of the world. Okay, cool. I don't know if you know this, but he's planning on, and I don't know how he's going to do this given he's held up in running, a... Running, yeah. Yeah, running for the Senate, yeah. So, I mean, maybe he's going to try and go for diplomatic immunity or something. Maybe he's going to send his hair yeah. to Australia to run in his place. Yeah, exactly. It looks like it's got a life of its own sometimes. Yeah. All right, so a couple more on this word association. Leo Laporte. All right. Boss. Eileen Rivera. Wife. Is that it? You don't want to elaborate? You don't want to say how <laughs> wonderful she is? Well, no, this is a word association. Of course I want to elaborate. I can talk all day about my wife. I love her. She's, a, she's the best thing ever that happened to me in my life. Excellent. Okay, so um, th that's all the questions that I have in, in, in relation to the interview. So, again, thanks for your time. Thanks for – it went a little bit longer than I expected. Yeah, you know, we've been chatting for the, the best part of an hour. So, I, again, I appreciate the fact that you've put a, an hour of what's your Saturday evening, my Sunday morning – aside for for us the show and, and aussie tech heads no worries uh this was fun good questions i enjoyed talking with you man okay excellent